Tonight we are going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 14 through 16. And what we're going to be talking about is suffering. Suffering is one of the most dis- difficult aspects of life that we can face. You know, I'm not talking about suffering as in like, oh, I got to get up early in the morning. That's not suffering. I often feel like it's suffering, but it's not suffering when you have to do things like that. Um, I'm talking about suffering as a believer, suffering for what you believe and who you are as a Christian. Um, when we see uh, someone suffering or when we're suffering ourselves, oftentimes it's, like it's hard to, to know how to handle it, what to do, what do you say, you know. Um, oftentimes, you know, as a pastor, uh, you get called out to a hospital call, you know, and, and those are always difficult for me because you walk into a very difficult situation. Oftentimes, if it's like, hey, they're on their deathbed and they wanted someone to come and pray, and, and you know, what do you say in those moments, you know? What, what do you say when someone's, you know, going through extreme trauma and, and you get the opportunity to share with them and encourage them, right? You know, you don't want to say stuff that's trite, you know, and you don't want to say the cliche things, you know. You don't want to give false hope, but you want to bring hope and you want to bring comfort. And, um, you know, the Bible has a lot to say about suffering. Uh, it has a lot to say th- in giving us proper understanding of what suffering is in the life of a Christian, how it works, how it operates. And tonight what we're looking at in, in this letter that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians is really to help us see suffering from God's perspective and to have a proper godly perspective on suffering. And so um, to kind of set the table for this, there's, there's really two types of suffering uh, we see biblically. Um, one of them is redemptive suffering. What I mean by redemptive suffering is it's the suffering we go through for the purpose of our redemption, the purpose of our sanctification, the purpose of our salvation. It's the suffering that, that has nothing to do with gaining salvation, um, but it has to do with us being conformed to the image of Christ. And oftentimes there's things we go through in our lives as believers that are difficult, but they're a part of the process that God is taking us through to conform us into the image of Christ. You know, and sometimes people use metaphors like he's chipping off the sharp edges and he's, you know, sanding down the rough spots. And those are all, you know, terms and metaphors that, that deal with breaking and, and, and harm to something. But it's, it's for the good. You know, when a sculptor is sculpting, he's breaking apart something to bring out the beauty that's within it. And, and that's what redemptive suffering is all about. You know, because we're forgiven, because we, we've been forgiven by the Lord, we could see suffering um, uh, through the gospel in a redemptive manner. We can understand that it has to do with, with the process that God's working in our lives. You know, God is using the suffering we're going through for a bigger purpose. He's using it. Uh, he has a plan. There's a reason behind what he's taken us through as believers. You know, Romans 8.28 says, We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. And I don't know about you, but there have been so many times in my life where I've had to hang on to that verse. You know, you're in the midst of it, and you have to go, you know, God is going to work all of this out for the good. I don't know how. I don't know when. I don't even know why. I don't get it. But I have to trust and believe that God's promises are true. And so this is the big picture of redemptive suffering for the Christian. This is um, knowing that, that as God works it all out for the good to, to make us more like his son Jesus, that it's a part of his redeeming us and sanctifying us and molding and shaping us. And so um, really in suffering, um, God causes us to grow in holiness. He causes us to grow in the things he's trying to get us to grow in. And even though there is struggle, the proper view of suffering is, is just what I said, that, that it is a work that God is doing. The opposite, or the other view of suffering that we see, is that suffering is somehow the judgment of God, or it's the condemnation of God. You know, and sadly, this view of suffering is, is often very prevalent in a Christian's life. When a Christian um, goes through a type of suffering, oftentimes the first thing they think is, God is mad at me. I did something wrong, right? Uh, but Christians don't endure that type of suffering. They don't endure the judgment, the condemnation of God. They have been forgiven of their sins. Um, suffering that, that, that's from condemnation and judgment does not have the goal of changing a person into the image of Christ. Quite the opposite. It has the goal of, of, of just bringing down God's wrath upon that person or upon that situation for the sin that it is. And sadly, Christians often view suffering in their lives, like I said, as God's condemnation. 
God's judgment on them. You know, we, we suffer and we conclude, you know, God's angry with me. If, if God wasn't angry with me, I wouldn't be going through this situation. Well, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, we're going to see both of these types of suffering. And Paul really explains uh, both suffering that is redemptive and suffering that is, that is from judgment. We're going to see that Christian suffering um, for the purpose of salvation and being conformed for, uh, to the image of Jesus is important. It's a, it's a part of the deal, but we're also going to see that unbelievers, those that don't know God, that aren't children of God, are suffering under an entirely different type of suffering, that it's really God's wrath that is falling upon them. And so let's go ahead and pray. Father, we, we thank you, God, for tonight, and we thank you for your word, and we thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to study it, God. We ask that you would speak to us, that you would teach us. Lord, we ask that you would conform us into your image, Lord, that we would be uh, more like you, God, in our thinking, our behavior, Lord, that as we, God, learn to look at uh, the suffering that we go through in our lives as believers, Lord, through the proper lens, through the lens that you have um, created, God, that we would be encouraged, Lord, and not discouraged, that we would be brought to a place of just understanding, Lord, that would bring us to a place of peace, to even, peace even in the midst of suffering. And so, God, we thank you. We love you so much. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the context of this, um, we got to jump back to verse 13, and that's kind of what we focused on last time I was with you guys, to really understand Paul's explanation of suffering. He, he uh, basically starts there in verse 13 being very thankful. And he, he starts out, he said, this is why we constantly thank God, because when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as a human message, but as it truly is the word of God. And so he was thankful that the Thessalonians had accepted the message that he came there to preach. And he was specifically thankful that they accepted it for what it was. It wasn't just Paul's words, but it was the word of God. It was God speaking to them. And God's word was at work at them in a very specific way as we get to verses 14, 15, and 16 that Paul says, I know you received it. I'm thankful you received it. And the, and the evidence that I know you received in the white ray is that you see your suffering properly. That's what he's going to get into here. And that's what really what the word of God does is help us to see our suffering properly, the way God sees it. It's redemptive. And so he says, you welcomed it not as a human message, but as it truly is, the word of God, which also works effectively in you who believe. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Christ Jesus that are in Judea since you have also suffered the same things from people of your own country, just as they did from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and persecuted us. And so really what Paul is encouraging them to do, and, and by extension encouraging us to do, is to see our suffering in the light of the cross, all right? To see our suffering, to process, to, to come to understanding why it's happening through the light of the cross. And the Thessalonians learned, uh, the first thing that they learned is that what they were suffering, the persecution they were suffering in Thessalonica, as the Roman authorities were coming against them for becoming Christians and coming against their churches, is that they were suffering the same type of thing that the other churches were suffering. They weren't alone in their suffering. He said there, for you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches. What he means by that phrase is, is you came to, to know God's word to the point where you were suffering for God's word, just like the other churches that are living God's word are. You were enduring it the same way. You were persevering it through the same way. You were, you were, you were going through the persecution and the suffering in the same way. And that's one of the first things that, that, that we have to understand is when we're suffering, it's not something unique to us. We're not the first Christian to have ever had to endure suffering. You know, and oftentimes we, we, we'll, we'll think that, oh my gosh, why is this happening? It, you're not alone. Every Christian goes through these types of things, and it's happened all the way back to the very beginning of the Christian church. All the way back at the beginning, the Christians were suffering for the sake of the gospel. They were suffering just because they identified as Christians. They were suffering simply because they said, I believe that Jesus Christ is God. And if you are suffering persecution from people because of your stance for God, you're doing something right. You're doing something right. You know, if people are, are annoyed because you're always talking about Jesus, you're doing something right. If your very presence, the way you live, you don't lie, you don't steal, you don't cheat, you don't clock in 
early and clock out late and you don't rob from your employer and, and all of that and it just drives the people around you crazy they hate you because of it because it makes them look bad you're doing something right because you're living as a just individual a person who represents god rightly now they could see their suffering in thessalonica in a redemptive light because it was the pattern right when christians live how Christians should live, persecution follows. That's the pattern. And Thessalonica, as Paul's telling them here, is, guys, you're following that pattern. This is a part of why I'm so thankful that when you received the word, and you didn't just think it was my word, you received it as God's word. It did a work in your life. Why? Because I'm watching the persecution happens and everybody that believes the gospel. I'm watching it take place. But it was more than that, because then in verse 15, he goes, You have also suffered the same things from people of your own country, just as they did from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and persecuted us. Jesus died for the gospel. The prophets died for bringing God's message to the people. Suffering as believers is, is not just a part of, oh, that's what we go through as believers. It's a part of God's bigger plan. It's a part of the plan of the gospel and the pattern of the gospel that we follow. It includes other churches, but it also includes the prophets. It includes Jesus. And then Paul said, not only did they kill the Lord Jesus and the prophets, they persecuted us. So we're in good company when we're suffering for the gospel. And that's something that's to bring comfort to us. I'm doing something right if I'm suffering for the gospel. It, it, it really is a picture of our union with Christ. You know, book of Philippians and in Colossians, they talk a lot about these concepts of being joined to Christ and being, being, being unified with him. And they talk about the, the unity of the fellowship of the believers and how Christians are a part of one family. Well, a part of that unity is that we suffer together. And we suffer, 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 suffer similar persecutions because we follow the same God and profess the same beliefs. Now, the specific type of suffering Paul is describing here is persecution. I've mentioned it a few times already. We suffer persecution because of our commitment to God. We suffer persecution because of our commitment to his word. We suffer it because of our identity as Christians. It's happening all over our society. It's happening more and more. And it's going to continue to happen more and more. You mean I, 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 my business... My livelihood has to be completely shut down and taken away from me simply because I won't bake you a cake? Like my life has to be destroyed because there's 400 other cake shops around here that'll gladly bake your cake, but because I won't do it, my life has to be destroyed. Yes, that's what a culture says. It's persecution. Or when you're passed over for the promotion, when you don't get the job, when you don't get the place you're trying to, to move to, whatever it may be, it's persecution. And we suffer it simply because of our identification as Christians. He's not talking about suffering because you did something stupid, right? You put a pot on the oven and you're, it's hot and it's boiling water you walk up and put your hand on it you're like oh i'm suffering for the lord oh, i'm in so much pain no you're dumb that's what happened you're dumb don't do that you know we bring plenty of suffering into our own lives that's really not suffering per se it's called consequences of poor decision making that's not what paul's talking about here okay what we're talking about is the suffering that happens you didn't do anything other than be a christian you didn't do anything other than profess the Lord. You didn't do anything other than stand for Christ. He's talking about suffering persecution because you're a believer. But we do suffer as Christians for, for other reasons and other situations, um, not just persecution. We go through different types of trials um, in, in, in situations that we endure as our faith is growing. You know, sometimes we're suffering because God has taken us through a phase of our life where, where he's wanting us to mature in certain areas. We have to give things up, or we have to break relationships with people or leave some old friends behind, right? And, and that can be a type of suffering that, that we got to go through and endure as, as Christians. 
But it's important to see that the suffering that we go through as Christians, that's not a result of us being dumb, is not God's judgment on us because we've made him angry. That's the lens that Paul's trying to get the Thessalonians to to understand their suffering through. That you're going through the suffering that you're going to go through, which means, which, which is evidence that, that you're, you're on the right path and you're following God's word and you're standing up for the right things. To see it as a redemptive process in our lives and the lives of others. That's what our suffering is as God's children, knowing that we're a part of the gospel process that goes out into the world. It's an important lens to see it through. I think sometimes we get all screwed up when we get caught up in the, oh, God's mad at me. Right? That's why I'm suffering. And so we start trying to, to backtrack and figure out why God's mad at me. And, then, and, then, and man, people come up with some weird things in this type of thinking. You know, oh, I only, I only prayed for five minutes today. I've got to do ten or God's going to be mad at me. Right? I only read one chapter today. That's why I'm suffering. God's angry. I could have read two. But I read one chapter and then I got stuck on Instagram for an hour. That's why God's mad at me. That's why I'm suffering. But that's not it at all. It's redemptive suffering for the life of a believer, for for one of God's kids. And it's a part of the process of the gospel. It's a part of the process of being a believer. It's a part of the process of the growth that he's trying to work in our lives. But the other type of suffering I talk about is suffering because of the wrath of God. Is suffering the, the wrath of God on sin. This is something terrible. This is something horrible. This is something we should never take lightly. This is something we should never look at or consider lightly because it involves the wrath of Almighty God and his condemnation. Look in verse 14. He says, For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, since you have also suffered the same things from people of your own country just as they did from the Jews. So there's, there's, there's two groups here. There's, there's two groups being persecuted, or there's a group being persecuted, and there's a group doing the persecuting, right? But there's two groups that are being persecuted. They're like Thessal- the Thessalonians. You're being persecuted like the people in Judea, all right? Just like the Jews persecuted the Judeans, the Romans are persecuting you. He's making a connection here. And he's saying you, you're, you're just like them. You're the same. You're a part of the same family because you're being persecuted by your own countrymen, Paul is not making a distinction here between Jew and Gentile. He is not trying to draw any type of racial division or racial lines in his understanding here. You know, they, those, those dirty Jews. Duh, duh, duh. That's not what Paul is getting into in any of this. Verses 15 and 16, he, he goes on to outline what the non-believing Jews did to the believing Jews in Judea. To, uh, to set up his point here, he says, They killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and persecuted us. They displease God and are hostile to everyone by keeping us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. As a result, they are constantly filling up their sins to the limit and wrath has overtaken them at last. So what he says there is is he's saying, Thessalonians, you're being persecuted like by the Romans just like the Judeans were being persecuted by the by the Jewish leadership, the non-believing Jewish leadership. And what did they do? Well, first they killed Jesus. They also killed prophets. They drove Paul out and persecuted him. Condemnation, judgment is coming upon them. Now, this isn't a text that is to be used to condemn Jews as a race. I bring that up because this text has been used over the centuries, and most recently during the Holocaust, to justify genocide on an entire race of people. Look, right here, the Bible says that these people are, are, are to be condemned and judged, and they should be wiped out. It's a horrible, horrible thing. The Bible should never be used in any way, shape, or form to pull something out of context to justify killing any group of people. There is no group of people that is outside God's love. There is no group of people that are outside God's plan of salvation, whether Jewish or any other group. Paul is not arguing against Jews as a race of people. He's arguing against what some of them did as a group within that group of people. And really what he's arguing against is that they denied Jesus 
Christ. He's not saying because they're Jews, they deserve to be condemned. He's going, these Jews, because they denied Jesus Christ, the wrath of God and suffering is going to come upon them. That's what he's saying. He's saying that these Jews people rejected their Messiah. Again, Paul's not instructing anybody here to, to ever come to a place of bringing judgment against a group of people simply because they are that group of people. Ethnically, racially. It really sets up a point we see that ultimate judgment is in God's hands and God's hands alone. And we need to understand that as believers. Judgment is in God's hands, not our hands. That, 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 that's God's business. He's the only wise judge, and such judgments should always be left up to God. We are to inspect fruit, but we're never to, to label condemnation, ultimate final condemnation in people's lives. We can't make that call. You know, sometimes you're witnessing to people and they'll try and bring up, you know, contradictions in the Bible or things. And they'll be like, well, you know, the Bible says don't judge people and you're judging me, right? The Bible says, condemn not, lest ye be condemned. That's what the word means. Now, you don't have the right to look at somebody and say, you're going to go to hell. You can't pass final condemnation on somebody. Only God can do that, Right? But other uses of the word judgment, we are to do as believers, you know, to inspect fruit, evaluate, you know, make, make judgment calls on, are they, are they walking with the Lord? Should I hang out with them? Should I, you know, that kind of stuff. Anyways, that's off topic. Um, ultimately, every single person on this earth, regardless of race, regardless of ethnicity, will be judged by one thing, whether or not they accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's it. We individually need to be worried about our own judgment, right? Am I going to be judged because I have not accepted Jesus Christ as my, Lord and, as my Lord and Savior? Have I repented of my sins? If you're not a believer in this room, the suffering you're going through is the condemnation, the wrath of God coming down you because of your sin. Yeah, it's the consequences of your sin, but the life you're going to live here and the suffering and the misery you're going to go through are going to pale in comparison to the ultimate misery of an eternity trying to pay the price for your sins in hell. That's ultimate suffering, ultimate judgment. And that is what's falling on the lives of those who don't have Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And these people Paul's talking about here, they came against Christ that came against the prophets, that are, have been coming against Paul, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, he's saying that judgment is coming upon them. What Paul is doing here in this passage is very similar to, to Jesus' language in Matthew chapter 23. If you want to turn there, feel free. If you don't, then don't. But Matthew chapter 23, verse 29, Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we wouldn't have taken part with them in shedding the prophets' blood. This is Jesus talking harshly to a group within the Jewish nation, the Jewish leadership that thought they were self-righteous. And in this passage in Matthew, Jesus pronounces seven woes on the Jewish leaders. It was very severe. It was a very, very harsh judgment. And what they were saying, and he's saying here is, during, they're, they're, they're saying during the days of the prophets, you know, uh, you know we, we wouldn't have rejected them. We wouldn't have killed the prophets like our forefathers did. No way we would have done this. But Jesus goes on to say in chapter 23, verse 31, he says, So you testify against yourselves that you are descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your ancestors' sins. Why did he say, as they're trying to proclaim, if the prophets were here, we wouldn't have killed them? Why, why did he say that? Because it, it tells us in that, in that text there that Jesus knew that in that very moment they were plotting to kill Jesus. They were in that very moment already making plans to kill him because of what he was saying. And so Jesus goes on with his condemnation of them. Snakes, brood of vipers in verse 33. How can you escape being condemned to hell? This is why I'm sending you prophets, sages, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them will, you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. Did you notice what he said there? 
He said, the suffering on, on, on those who are trying to bring you the message of God is going to continue. He said, some of them you're going to flog in your synagogues, and some of them you're going to pursue from town to town. And is that not exactly what Paul had been experiencing through his entire ministry? As he went to Philippi and preached the gospel. And the Jewish leaders going, hey, they're, they're, not, wor- they're not worshiping Caesar, and chased him out of Philippi. And then they get the Thessalonica, and they start preaching the gospel, and the Jewish leaders are like, no, no, no. And they raise up the Roman leadership, and they chase him out of Thessalonica. And it just happened over and over with Paul. But there's inter- something interesting he says there in Matthew 23, verse 23, I believe it is. No, not 23, 32. He says, fill up then the measure of your ancestors' sins. What does that even mean? It's similar language to what Paul is using here in 1 Thessalonians 2.16. He goes, and you could go back to 1 Thessalonians if you want. Paul says, as a result, they are constantly filling up their sins to the limit, and wrath has overtaken them at last. What does it mean to fill up your sins? What does it mean to be, to be filled up on sins? It's a biblical concept that appears um, throughout Scripture at, at, at significant redemptive historical times or epochs, right? At these, at these certain times where God was about to do away with something old and bring in something new, you see this concept of the old or the sin or the, one, the ones that aren't doing what God wants You see this phrase of them being able to fill up their sins, and it's used to describe the opponents um, to God's plans. What God is stating here is that, when he uses this phrase, is that the enemies of God had to to complete a certain amount of sin, if you will, before they were considered ripe for definitive judgment. That's what he's talking about. Like, you're sinning against God. God. And this is one of the big mysteries people go, you know, how come I'm suffering and I'm walking with God and I'm trying to live for Jesus and this guy over here is is a drug addict and an alcoholic and a womanizer and a thief and he's prospering and I'm not. What is going on? Well, you need to see your suffering through the lens of redemptive suffering because that guy is sitting in the lens of condemnation and judgment. Well, when? How come come they're... just wait. Just wait. When they have filled up their sins, when their life has gotten to the point where they come to stand before God and God consigns them to hell, there's going to be no possible way anybody can say, well, if you just gave him this chance, he had it. If you just did this in his life, he would, nope. They ha- when someone is judged and comes under the wrath of God and is consigned to hell. That ultimate and permanent and final suffering is going to be without blame. Nobody will be able to say, God, you're unfair. And so this phrase, he's like, fill up in the measure of your ancestors' sins. It's like, keep, 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 keep denying God. Keep fighting against God. Keep railing against God. Keep rejecting Jesus. Keep doing it. Because when it gets to the point where you come to stand before God, there is going to be no possible, yeah, but, no. My final judgment, my wrath being poured on you is definitive, it is final, it is complete, and it is righteous. But throughout the Bible, you see this phrase, and, and, and you know, God would wait for these people to like fill up on their sins, and then he would bring judgment upon them, and it would conclude a particular time period, and then it would launch another time period. And, and like I said, you would see this through the Old Testament consistently when there was something old, an old nation, an old way of doing things was being done away with, and God was moving on to something new. Examples, Genesis 15, 16, God told Abram, his descendants would not emerge from Egypt until the sins of the Amorites were complete. They would not leave Egypt until the sins of the Amorites were complete or filled up or reached their full measure, depending on when, what translation you got. The image there is that the Amorites had a certain amount of time to either turn to God or get to the place where God said, okay, you're done. I've given you every opportunity to turn to me. Daniel spoke of a judgment that would come at the end of an age in Daniel chapter 8, verses 23 through 25. Daniel said this, Near the end of their kingdoms, when the rebels had reached the full measure of their sin, a ruthless king 
skilled in intrigue, will come to the throne. His power will be great, but it will not be his own. He will cause outrageous destruction and succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy the powerful along with the holy people. And that's future prophecy yet to come. For the Christians, when we look around the world and we're like, God, how long are you going to allow this suffering to happen? He's going to allow it to happen to the point when he brings judgment upon sin. Finally, nobody's going to be able to question him. Nobody's going to be able to question whether he was totally and completely fair. But the problem is, is nobody in this room knows when that time is going to come in your individual life. You don't know when that moment is going to come where you stand before God. And it is a great and terrifying risk to take to say, maybe I'll turn to God in repentance tomorrow. Because you may have already reached the limit of the sin and God is going to take you. Something may happen on the way home. You can get in a car accident. You could have a heart attack. And you're going to find yourself standing before God. And judgment is going to fall upon you because you're going to say, but God, nope, I gave you every opportunity, but you reached the fill of your sin. But the fact that you're still here breathing right this second means you still have a moment to turn to Christ. It means you still have the opportunity to repent of your sins. It means you have an opportunity to, to move from the place of, of suffering under God's wrath to moving into forgiveness, moving into eternal life. And yeah, there's going to be suffering of a different kind. But it's a part of a process of conforming you into a holy and a perfect, the image of our holy and perfect God. So what Paul is saying here in 1 Thessalonians 2 it's the same thing we read in the Gospels. It's the same thing we read in the Acts concerning Israel. It's the same thing we read uh, throughout Scripture regarding other nations in the Old Testament. It's not some type of racial or racist statement by Paul. He's, he's referring to redemptive historical um, um, situations. He's referring to God's purpose and plan. God's purpose and plan that none would perish. But some are going to reject him and perish. That's not what God wants. But those that reject Christ all the way to the point of death, he's going to judge you. And God is here tonight saying, please, I love you so much. I don't want to bring the wrath upon you. I don't want eternal, forever suffering to be your end result. I want you to be forgiven. I want you to have eternal life. I want you to, to, to have forever with me in heaven. But you have to accept it. You have to receive it. Paul wanted nothing more than for the Jewish people to get saved. He even said in one part of Scripture, I believe it was Romans chapter 9, verse 3, he said, I, I would even give my own life if Israel could be saved. All the suffering that Paul went through as a believer, he knew was a part of the mission to get the gospel out to those that need it. To get this message into people's hands that don't know Christ, that you need to turn to him because judgment is coming. Everything Paul went through was about that. He knew that if, that if the Jewish people, these people he was just writing about, if they just turned to Jesus as their Messiah, if they just accepted that, they would move from the place of wrath to the place of grace. All they had to do was to turn from the temples and the sacrifices as a means of forgiveness and turn to God and turn to the cross. And many did. But unfortunately, many did not. Because in A.D. 70, the temple was destroyed. God destroyed the temple through the hands of the Roman Empire as it was prophesied in Matthew chapter 24. It was likely, I believe, Paul's point at the end of verse 16 there when he says, but God's wrath has overtaken them at last. That he was referring to this moment. And it was because they rejected Christ's salvation. They rejected God's plan and God's wrath came upon them. When you reject grace, the only thing that is left is wrath. Acts 4.12 says there is no salvation. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Paul's point here to the Thessalonians and these verses we've been looking at tonight to those that were suffering is, look, take heart. For the Christians, 
as we're going through our stuff, as we look around the world, as we suffer for our stand as Christians, as we, as we suffer for our stand for the gospel, as we suffer persecutions because we stand for what is right, he says, take heart. God is judging those who stand against him. But don't ever mistake his patience as, as, as he's okay with it. He just wants more to get saved. And that is often why he allows us to go through the suffering. As we learn to suffer as Christ did, as we learn to suffer as Paul and the prophets did, as we learn to go through all that, it's a part of us understanding that the gospel is worth it. That people's lives are worth it. And he wants us to be a part of that battle. And so it doesn't matter whether we're Jewish, Roman, European, African, Asian, American, whatever. If you reject God's offer through King Jesus, he's going to speak to you in wrath. But if you accept his offer, he speaks to you in grace. If you turn away from Christ, you turn right into the wrath of God. And that's not what God wants for you. So we're going to pray right now. And while we're praying, if you're in this room and, and God has been speaking to you tonight, you know you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe the Holy Spirit has revealed to you tonight that, that he's done. That you have filled up the measure of your sins. That this is the moment you need to turn to Christ because you may not have a moment after this. While we're praying with all our heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm not going to ask you to stand up. I'm just going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. And this prayer is just a simple prayer of confessing your sin and accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So if you know you have sinned against God, you know you have never received him as your Lord and Savior, you know that you were not forgiven right this second. But you want to be. Pray with me now. Say, God, I know I've sinned against you. I know the suffering in my life is a result of the sin that I currently live in. I know, God, that I deserve judgment. I know that I deserve the penalty of sinning against you. But God, I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. I believe you bled for me. And I ask you, God, to forgive me of all of my sins. Wash me clean of all the ugliness. Accept me into your family as your child. Move me from wrath to grace. My life is yours, Lord. I ask you to teach me, to mold me, to shape me. Thank you for loving me so much. In Jesus' name. Now we can't forget who's writing these words. This was Paul, the former Pharisee, which he was one of the leaders among the Jews, these people he was just saying that, 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 took the steps to kill Jesus and kill the prophets. This was Paul, the chief persecutor of the church in the book of Acts. This is the one who opposed God's plan and, and, and opposed God's offered salvation. That's the man writing this letter right now. But he did all that until he came face to face with his Lord, the one true Messiah on the Damascus road. And when he realized Jesus was Messiah, when he accepted that Jesus was Messiah, as some of you may have just done, his heart was changed by the word who became flesh, Jesus Christ. The man who had once killed Christians who opposed God's plan with everything he was had met the grace of God in the person of Jesus. And that is what we call coming to Christ. And he was now living in that grace, loving his fellow Christians, seeking to bring the good news to the world. And from that point forward, as a believer... As a Christian, one who is saved, Paul saw his own suffering through his Savior, Jesus Christ. 
He knew that when he suffered from that point forward, it wasn't because God's wrath was upon him. It was instead that God was doing a redemptive work in his life, molding and shaping him into the perfect picture that God created him to be. Not the judgment of God. That had passed from Paul and has passed from your life to the cross. And so for all of us that are Christians in this room tonight, is that true for you? Is that how you're living tonight? Do you see your suffering as a part of your redemption? Do you see your suffering through that lens that this is a work God is doing? That this is a result of me doing the right thing, standing for the gospel? Do you see it that way? Do you realize that God is at work in your suffering, not to destroy you, but to save you? Or are you still living that old life, viewing your suffering as God's judgment on you? Thinking God's out to get you every day because you screwed up. If you're a believer in this room and you're living that way, I want to free you from that. Because you're not living by faith in his promise. Because God said this, and this is his promise to every single Christian in this room tonight. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, for our new brothers and sisters, Lord. We thank you, God, for the work you're doing in all of our lives. Lord, we trust you. We believe you. We believe your word, God. And Lord, we thank you so much for the salvation that you have given us in Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, that we were able to go from wrath to grace. That, Lord, getting saved isn't about, oh, I'm not going to suffer anymore. Life is going to be perfect. No, getting saved is about, I have been made right with my creator. And that I know that when this life, this brief life ends, that instead of eternal suffering and judgment, I will stand in beauty and holiness and perfection with my creator, my savior. And so God, we thank you so much for that. Lord, I pray for any believer in this room tonight, God, that has been living in that mindset of I'm suffering because I screwed up. I'm suffering because God's mad at me. I'm suffering because God is, is condemning, condemning me. Lord, if we are suffering because we're standing for the gospel and standing for righteousness, God, I pray for those people that are feeling that lie and that they would realize in this moment that the suffering they're doing for going through for the right things is a part of a work you're doing in their lives and that is beautiful lord and so god may we turn to you and pray for patience and pray for strength and pray for everything we need to be the light we need to be in those moments of suffering god if we're suffering because we're idiots and making stupid decisions god deal with that Lord, we do love you because you care so much about us, God. Lord, we love you. And you, you, you do so many wonderful things for us. You care about us. You take care of us. You teach us all of it, Lord. God, thank you so much. Lord, help us to love you better. Help us to live for you better. Help us to stand for you more. And give us opportunity to be a light in this very dark and lost world. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you guys. Let's worship.